if we're doing the last talk when it's actually quite a niche area, and I'm, I'm thinking, have I been put here at the end because uh, it's kind of uh, you know, the end and people can fall asleep, or have I put the end because it's the uh, best talk on the whole program? Um, and it's also weird on a couple of counts because actually I, I started my improv life uh, in a murder mystery company, running a murder mystery company for years, so that's kind of a bit weird. Um, and I also use more improv in a corporate setting, working with personal impact in leadership programs. Um, but I'm actually talking about the other half of my life, um, which is as a speech and language therapist, speech and language pathologist, if you're uh, from the US. Um, and I still retain a practice as a, a voice therapist and a voice coach. I specialize in voice, um, and I teach voice in university. And um, moved into specialising in trans voice and communication in 2006. And I'm doing some consultancy work with the Tavistock Trust in London, which runs the largest gender clinic in the UK. And, and traditional voice therapy ha has always approached voice, um, you know, learning voice skills, and then working through a hierarchy of learning to transfer that voice into lived situations. So single words, phrases, sentences, conversations, then moving to role play, um, and I began thinking about using improv, um, and so the, uh, the colleague that I work with and I have been doing some initial studies and we've had some fantastic results using improv in, in the group work that we do. And I, I think I just wanted to kind of talk about why, um, for me, it's, it's so exciting and it, and it works really well for people who are trying to um, modify their voices as part of their transition. So for those of you who don't know, um, not all people who are transitioning will come and see us. Some people transition very happily and uh, never see them. Um, so the people we work with have gender dysphoria, which is the distress around their um, identity, around the fact that um, there's a lack of congruence between the, the uh, gender they identify with and the sex that they were assigned natally. And so that distress is, is what really um, uh, people come and, and we work with. And around voice and communication, which is where I'm going next, um, there, are, there are lots of things that actually um, create a lack of congruence uh, and, and therefore anxiety, um, particular to the voice. Just before I move on to voice, you know, we live generally in a binary world. I think what's really interesting, and, and, and not too long ago, people used to talk about um, speaking with a male voice, speaking with a female voice. I've been having conversations this last few days with people about both the safety and the danger of, of the dichotomous world that we live in. And, and the absolute division between male voice, female voice is, is certainly not useful at all um, for the people that I work with. And it creates a very black and white view about what women should sound like, what men should sound like. And that poses problems not only for people who are transitioning as trans women, trans men, but also people who are non-binary, who are gender diverse. So we tend, to, we're trying to move towards thinking about voice as a continuum, from the most masculine to the most feminine. Um, before I talk about improv, let's um, just have a look. There we are. What are those? Your vocal folds. You might call them vocal cords, they're vocal folds. Um, so a nice healthy pair of vocal folds there. Uh, and of course, part of the work is, is physical, is muscular. We have to train, help people train their voices. There's no two ways around it, there's no shortcut. Um, people have to learn about their instruments and they have to work with, uh, with, with producing a different target pitch, different resonance, so we're talking about pitch, resonance, voice quality, and then what happens when you take that voice into speech. So here's um, a set of vocal folds working very carefully.
Those ones, there. Um, so, so those, of course, that was a, of course, um, for opera singers who were using voice in a very healthy and sustainable way. But one of the phenomena that you might not know about voice is that um, it's not for voice at all. Vocal folds aren't for voice at all. Anyone know what, what the vocal folds are for? Elimination of air, no. But they're a safety valve. So they protect the air. So their primary function is nothing to do with voice. Their primary function is to protect the airways. And so what happens is, is that they will want to close. So basically these healthy vocal folds here, but also these what we call false vocal folds either side, uh, will want to actually close, tighten, lock, protect the airway anytime there's a perceived threat. Now what that means is it could be a perceived threat as in standing, doing a presentation where voice becomes dry, uh, breathing you know, becomes more rapid and so the voice tries to lock, lock that down. Uh, it might be a psychological threat, so going into a situation, a psychosocial um, factor where the situation is complex and messy and unpredictable, like all of human communication, and somebody is trying to practice a modified voice, uh, and it locks together, or a few minutes ago. So just, um, so just close your eyes, and just try your own voice uh, as a completely effortless voice, so your most effortless voice, just by counting very easily, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Some people went on to ten. Can you just count one, two, three, four, five? No effort. One, two, three, four, five. Now, those of you who have a more masculine voice, you might want to put that effort into raising voice to sound more feminine. Not too high, just push it a little bit in terms of effort. Those of you with a more feminine voice might want to try and use that effort to push your voice down. So this time, really feel the different effort it takes just to count one, two, three, four, five, if you're going into a more feminine voice, or one, two, three, four, five, if you're pushing it down into a masculine voice. Yeah. And then just back to your effortless voice, just effortless voice, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Okay, so the voice likes to, it, it, it likes to be effortless, and in communication particularly, it likes to be effortless. And of course, you're used to your voices going all over the place. When you did that lovely siren at the beginning of my talk, uh, you were effortlessly gliding through your range up and down, uh, using a lot of flexibility. For people who hate their voices and feel that their voice does not match who they are, there's a huge amount of fear associated with moving it anywhere. So they may not like the voice they've got, but actually moving to anything else is also extremely frightening because it brings with it that whole connection between voice and emotion. Um, and, and so moving towards um, putting voice, I mean, we can train voice, we can use exercises and pitch resonance, but actually when we come to put voice into lived experience, for me, improv has, has been absolutely fantastic. Even the little work that we've done so far in really helping to free up and allow people to play with their voices and, and to, to be who they are. So for me, above all, it's, it's about not, you know, people uh, come with a lot of um, history of thinking they should sound a certain way. They might come wanting the perfect voice and the perfect set of communication skills uh, to match the gender that they prefer and identify with. And basically that's not going to happen, it's certainly not going to happen straight away, it takes a lot of hard work. And also when, when people meet um, social situations, then uh, if, you, if you put too much into a different voice, then, then authenticity tends to be sacrificed. So the kind of improv games that we're playing in groups are about using the whole continuum of not only voice, but also uh, other communication skills, you know, people can actually lose a lot of facial expression with that fear, they're not smiling, um, they may have quite rigid uh, physical, non-verbal behaviour, so we can play with a lot of different exercises. For me, I think I've, I have really enjoyed using pause <laughs> and vulnerability of course is in there. So, um, 
I've really enjoyed using Paul's life path, and that's what I'm going to take back, because I think the structure, freedom within that structure, for me, makes more sense. <laughs> We wrote, if people are interested in voice, I can talk to you more about that. And there's a great book if you work with trans people. I do just have one more, one more thing to say, which is, yeah, let us see. which was my plea, really, to just um, to be aware. You know, I'm not a gender police person. But I am actually, you know, interested when people uh, can be mindful of the language that they use. And when we did a lovely exercise yesterday, the reporter, the hype, uh, and the rap, and so on, um, you know, instantly there was kind of, you know, you can be a hype man or a hype woman, obviously. Little things like that. It's not about huge transphobia, but it's about little tiny bits of language that instantly can make people feel shame and then self-silence and avoid talking. And so, you know, to, to kind of transform your language for me is the key. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. And as we are moving slowly into the break, we have Pascal having some short announcements for you. All right, thank you very much.